finally, I'm going to end with um, my most recent work. I got um, commissioned by National Geographic to um, document New York City during the moment of COVID. And so I went out and uh, rented a helicopter. We had to get special permission because New York, uh, at the peak of COVID during uh, the first week of April, was a no-fly zone. I mean, there was nothing in the air. And so I, uh, I have an old pilot buddy of mine, a guy named Al Cirillo, who I've worked with for decades. And uh, Al shot with me during Hurricane Sandy when I photographed that image of the roller coaster in the ocean. Um, and we got permission to fly above New York. And so I did a series of photographs. You know, I talk about uh, the image uh, in your mind. And I've, I've come to a point in photographing for four decades where I actually, when I think about photographing, I actually sometimes see an image before I photograph it. This is one of those instances. Um, I had an idea. I remember speaking to my photo editor, Kathy Moran, at the Geographic. I said, Kath, I'm going to look for an angle where I can get the city on fire. I had this idea, I, to me, it's like uh, the New York is burning with a fever. New York is on fire um, and, and with COVID. And this was April 1st. I was taking off from New Jersey. I knew that New Jersey had the potential for this type of a relationship. But in, in my wildest dreams, I never thought I'd get this because this is a really hard thing to capture. Uh, and uh, um, as we were uh, taking off, I went up in the afternoon. I did a bunch of stuff over the city initially. And then I planned on coming back at sunset uh, to the New Jersey side, hoping that I'd find this. And I turned to Al and I said to him, you know, Al, let's make sure you, you're back in time for sunset because we just might, when I was taking off, I could see the angle of light. We just might get it tonight. It might just be right this time of year. I really didn't know. And uh, as we flew, uh, we got towards sunset. We started heading back. And all of a sudden, uh, because of COVID, I was on the opposite side of Al. And normally, I always fly on the same side of him with one door open. We're both in, looking at the same thing. But because of COVID, I'm on the opposite side of his aircraft. And so I, I can't really see what he sees. And he can't really see what I see. So um, I'm leaning. And I'm looking to the opposite side. I'm leaning over. And I see the light reflecting off of his windshield. And I go, oh, my God. Al, he goes, Stephen, he goes, you're going to flip out. And he literally banks the helicopter. And this is what I see. I see the gold light glowing off these buildings. And then this huge cloud comes overhead. And it, like I said, it was just a, uh, an extraordinary moment. Um, one that, for me, gave me chills because I think it, it spoke volumes to what the city was experiencing in this physical moment in time, April 1st. Uh, so the reason I went up that night was because it was the last night that uh, the Empire State Building was doing a special lighting display to pay, uh, um, you know, really celebrate the heroic efforts of all our first responders and the healthcare workers who were literally saving so many lives in New York City, uh, working around the clock and risking their lives for all the fellow New Yorkers. And they were uh, at about nine o'clock at night. They would turn the, the, the empire would turn red and begin to glow and white lights would pop on it. And, you know, there'd be this um, kind of siren that would go off like an ambulance siren. And um, I knew I wanted to capture this, but I'm shooting in the dead of night. And um, I was working with this new uh, Fuji camera, which is kind of extraordinary. Um, it enabled me to shoot 128,000 for you tech heads, 128,000 ISO hanging out of a chopper to get this photograph. So this is a picture you honestly could not take unless you were shooting digital. You never could have done this picture with film. Uh, this is another one I did uh, looking down. I said to Al, I wanna get up, up, get as high as you can get me um, over New York City. And I looked down and I remember it was emotional because you know, I've spent so many decades, you know, my last decade photographing New York City day to night. And my work is really about a celebration of, of the, you know, the energy that is New York, the movement, the way the people sort of, um, it's almost a form of emergent behavior I've described it as. And here I was over my favorite city, the city that I love so much, and you couldn't even see a taillight through every avenue and every street. It was just completely like everybody was gone. And it was, um, it was emotional for me, to be frank, to see this, to witness this. Um, I remember it, it gave me a chill down my spine uh, to look at this and realize what was happening, how, how, how everything had changed in, in just these few weeks. And then I, 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 I 
was flying over Park Avenue. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw this window and I, I took out a long lens. This is shot with a 250 millimeter lens at night. And I compressed it. And I, I'm looking at, you know, of course, Grand Central. And it, it was as if, you know, uh, it was the only light like in the city, like this brilliant light. Like it was almost like there would be light at the end of the tunnel for me. Um, but to see it so empty and you can, uh, you can just feel uh, everybody's in their apartments trying to, uh, you know, avoid going out um, in, in this, this upside down world that we're all living through. In the morning, I went out uh, for sunrise and I wanted, I had an idea, I wanted to go over. There was a, um, I've always been struck by the view from the Kosciuszko Bridge of New York City. And uh, so I flew over the Kosciuszko right at sunrise and I discovered this sign. It said courage. And I thought, oh, that's just, that's it. That's what we all need right now is courage. That's what, what these workers, these people, these essential workers that are really risking their lives for all of us are, are doing. And so this was a, a powerful picture. Rush hour, you'd never see this ever uh, again, uh, you know, on, in normal times. You'd never see this roadway this empty at rush hour. One of the other things was I always look for like moments in the city against all odds. And I found this guy sunbathing um, in the middle of this, almost it looked like a quilt uh, of the spring flowers and the buildings, the rows of townhouses in Chelsea. There's a guy, you know, on his lounge chair without a mask on or anything, he's sunbathing. Washington Square Park, looking straight down. The Flatiron Building, almost midday. Look at that, it's empty. Bryant Park, lunchtime. And there's actually one guy, he's working in the fountain. He's a parks employee, he's fix, fixing the fountain. Astounding. And there's all little moments going on in this picture, you know, it's social distancing narratives. Yeah, these are gonna be very historic pictures. Thank you. I, I felt that way, Kevin. I wanted to do it because I knew, I knew they would be history. And, and you know, one of the things that has been so important to me uh, is I feel as a documentary photographer, I, I, I want to shoot history. I, 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 it's one of been one of the great drivers in my work. It, it gives my work purpose. And I think purpose is, a, is an essential thing in photography. I think you can have a passion to photograph, but when you find purpose in your work, it elevates it to a different level. Um, when you can forge change in your work, when you can make a difference through your photographs, I think that's what it's really about. And once you have that luck of being able to have that happen to you, like what happened to me for in Ellis Island, it's a gift that you know you just you just want to always experience that somehow. You want to you want to do pictures that make a difference. Well, your your whole career seems to have that as a, a commonality through it. When even with the, the the wildlife side of things you're doing, and yeah, it's it's. Thank you. It's, it is something that's really important to me. It's, I describe, it's really the purpose. It's my work is all purpose driven. And, um, you know, yes, I love making beautiful photographs and yes, I, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm drawn to light and all the aesthetic things that, that we speak about and through photography, but I, I'm looking for, you know, something else about it. I want it to, uh, inspire people in a way, drive people to think about things. You know, it's interesting. You, you were, Obviously, when you worked with Jay and, you know, Jay's belief on things with form and gesture and, you know, the, the things that he says, and now you, 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 you've kind of gone in a different direction, as influenced as you probably are in many ways by him, you know, but you, you use a singularity of, of, of purpose here, and it really is incredible how it is a common thread through all your images. Yeah, well, thank you. I pr really appreciate that, um, you saying that. It's... Um, it is really important to me. And, you know, as, as I've reflected over, over the years of doing this, this, this thing that I love, this gift that I, I think we're all blessed to, to be able to experience uh, being photographers and artists and, and, and photographing what we love. I do think that though, as I, as I, I look back over the work and, and the work that speaks and the work that, that still resonates is the work that I really have a purpose in. You know, I think that's, um, that, that's where it, where it really hits for me. And, and, and so as, you know, I look at my work now and what I'm doing, and I always say, you know, as you get older, you know, it's not as easy to do the things you used to do. Um, and I, I still got gas in the tank, but I've become much more selective in what I want to talk about and the things I want to say and the projects I want to, I want to um, focus on because um, I know I, I've got a certain window uh, to be able to do the things I want to do. Sure. And um, this was a photograph that really um, gave me chills. 
Um, of course, this was the uh, temporary hospital that was built uh, in the East Meadow of Central Park. I'd heard about it and we flew out uh, to try to get a picture. Um, and I remember when Al banked the helicopter and we were very respectful. I didn't want to fly too low. Uh, I didn't want to disturb anybody of what they were going through in, in those tents. And it was, believe me when I tell you, it was, this was really, New York was in real trouble uh, during this period of time. Um, but seeing this, seeing the epic grandeur of New York, and, and then just to see this hospital nestled in these white tents, um, it was just this um, strange, strange duality that I was experiencing uh, in terms of, you know, what the visual was saying versus what, you know, what I was feeling emotionally. Hmm. And then I, I flew over, you know, the Lincoln Tunnel. Uh, in fact, I, I had done a picture with Al uh, for an ad. It was for Compaq. And we flew at rush hour over this exact area, looking straight down on it. And it was uh, so crowded with cars. The ad was it, so that each car looks like it's almost data going through a, 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 you know, a point. So that's how crowded it was. In fact, I, I have to take some credit. Um, when you do 500 feet over uh, the Lincoln Tunnel, you create a traffic jam, essentially, because people are curious. I'm hanging out of a chopper, you know, in a, in a basically tethered, you know, I'm literally leaning off the skids. So I was, you know, I was a sight to see. Uh, but for me to fly over this at the peak of rush hour and see essentially, you know, four buses and that's, there's no other cars. It was, it was unbelievable. I mean, it was just unbelievable that this is what things had become. You know, it was that, it was that empty. And this was the RFK bridge at rush hour. Park Avenue. Again, rush hour, you know, it's empty. And then Times Square. This was uh, probably of all the shots, one of the toughest shots to get. You know, what's interesting about New York City, it is in many ways like a forest when you get above it at a certain altitude. So it, it's almost like the buildings become trees and you, you have to really peer through like the canopy to be able to see things. And so... To get this angle, to be able to finally see this, I said to Al, I said, you know, I want to make sure I want to get the, the billboards and that iconic, you know, where the ball drops uh, view. And he made one bank and we, we couldn't, we cornered it. And all of a sudden we hit it. And then as we hit it, the boards changed and those signs came up. It was to those fighting for our lives. Thank you. You know, to our frontliners. There's your angel again. There's my angel again. It was an angel because, believe me, he couldn't hold that hover very long. So if I missed that, I wasn't going to wait another minute and a half for the sign to come back on. That was not happening. You know, so <laughs> lucky, lucky. Yeah. But like Jay says, and what is it? Jack Nicholas used to say, "The more you practice, the luckier you get." There you go. <laughs> uh, finally, this is a Vanity Fair series I did. So Vanity Fair, after I did the geographic piece, you know, I was staying at home like everybody else, like we all have. And uh, they called me up, they go, hey, would you like to do a series of pictures of, you know, what your stay at home is like, like maybe do some shots of your house and the light. And I go, you know, I don't really want to, you know, I'm not interested in that. Um, and that morning I was watching a television show and I heard this mother crying her eyes out uh, of this lovely African-American mother who had lost her daughter, who was 27 years old, um, and she had um, a muscular dystrophy. And she had a job, and she worked at a giant supermarket. She made about $20 a day, and she was so thankful for her job. And the mother is on the air. Her daughter uh, called her and said, Mama, I got to go to work because all these elderly people rely on me, and I can't not go to work. And her mother was hysterical. She says, Honey, you can't go. You can't, you know, honey, you're, you're going to get sick. You can't protect She's Mom, I'm going to wear a mask. Don't worry. She went to work. She contracted the virus and she died. Oh. And so the mother's on the air holding the $20 check and the thank you note from Giant Supermarket. And I'm watching this and I just had to, I just became overwrought with emotion. I, for the first moment, realized, wait a second, that's an essential worker. These people who are out there getting our deli that you, you, you're able to pick up delivery, uh, the, 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 the guy who's in the train, uh, who's the conductor of the train, who's handling all the tickets, the, you know, the butcher who's cutting the meat, all these essential workers, the, the police officers, the, the, uh, you know, the firemen, the uh, EMS guys, they are making such a difference in our lives. So I said to Vanity Fair, I said, 
I saw this, I walked into my studio, I had a scheduled phone call. As soon as I go into my studio, I have a library that I come through before I enter my studio. And in the library, I saw two books on the top. One of them was by August Sander, and the other one was by Walker Evans. I looked at the August Sander, and it was his Worker series. And all of a sudden, it was like, and the Walker Evans had this, the cover of the woman in front of the storefront, and I go, oh my God, that's it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do Walker Evans and, and August Sander style imagery of essential workers in my hometown. So I pitched the idea to Vanity Fair. They loved it. And then I had to go out in the middle of this pandemic. And believe me when I tell you, Westport was the hottest area in all of Connecticut. We had one couple that had a, a Bon Voyage party and 50 people uh, were at the party. And those 50 people were all infected by one guy. And he got on a plane and flew to South Africa and he infected everybody on that plane. And then he affected, I mean, it was just unbelievable. You couldn't even contact trace what went on here. So it was a scary time here in Westport, Connecticut. And people like Gold's Deli, my deli, they were like doing a heroic job. And so I decided to do this series. I went to a, a, my local butcher at Fleischer's and I did a portrait of the butcher. And these were all done from outside looking in, by the way. So uh, this is our male, male, our local male girl who's a lovely person who I did a portrait of. Um, so I wanted to tell these stories uh, uh, and showcase these people in the most heroic ways. But there's something very wrong in all my pictures, right? Because they're all wearing masks and gloves. And they capture this moment in history. This is one of my best friends. He happens to be the head of infectious disease at Bridgeport Hospital and was working literally 24 hours a day with COVID. And I photographed him at the hospital in the COVID center. This is a young man who packs bags at Stu Leonard's. Um, and just did a heroic job. And, you know, I looked at him and I, I caught this moment and I, he and I really were feeling the same way. I had as much anxiety as he was having, but he was actually working there every moment of the day. And, you know, um, Stu's made a huge difference in everybody's lives uh, in terms of this pandemic, being making sure that not only did they protect their employees, but, but really make sure that, that they maintain the food supply for everybody. Carvel, you know, life's simple pleasures, a, a sweet, a treat during this very negative time in our lives makes a huge difference. I remember driving by Carvel and seeing the woman with the mask and I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy, you know, and, but, but this is what was going on. Um, it was one of the local firemen uh, whose lives changed, you know, the, these guys walking into houses, um, the EMS guys, this is the train conductor on Metro North. This is what their life has become, you know. These guys, every day, many of them don't have support systems. They go home to their families at night. You know, the risk of, of spreading this to your family is huge. Yeah, tell me about it. And you know that, Kevin. Sure, I know better than anybody. Um, and, uh, and this was an EMS truck driver. And this was a pretty scary picture. I, I opted to go inside the EMS truck because I wanted you to feel um, what it was like from the darkness to go in, you know, to, to, to be within, to look out. Obviously, you're masked up and PPE'd and everything. Yeah, yeah, I am. And then these guys, um, and to me, was classic, like Walker Evans, uh, almost like from the 1950s. They, uh, uh, these guys, Currys, they've been serving people, and they're essential. You know, people get flat tires, and they're uh, literally fourth generation. The two brothers run it, and so I did this portrait of them in front of their shop. And then finally, I'm going to share the last thing. These are a series I call Drive By in black and white. For the first time, I went back to black and white. I haven't shot in many, many years. But New York feels black and white to me right now. And so I, uh, I started doing a series where uh, my assistant and I, he drives. I shoot out the window. I don't get out on the street. I'm too nervous to. And I just started documenting what I was seeing. These... Stephen really were impressive when I started seeing these. You posted a couple of them to Instagram or Twitter, and I'm thinking, "Wow, Stephen's shooting black and white." Yeah, I did the, some of the, uh, the 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 parade, not the the march, the big march in New York City. I was there for one night, um, uh, but these are really, you know, um, yeah, it's it's funny, you know, Jeff. I I, I love black and white. I, I don't do it a lot, but I don't know. I I, I started as I started shooting this work. I, you know, I, I just felt like it, it's, it's kind of a black and white time in New York right now. It just is. And uh, this woman was out on Times Square and she's just, I mean, I, I don't know where she comes from, but she, 
Uh, she was banging on the, the like had a bass drum made out of a Dallas barbecue chicken thing. And she's screaming and got the whole thing. And then this guy in the background, I just thought him like yelling to her, but no masks, no nothing. Um, and then uh, this guy, bad boy world uh, was really something. You know, I, I've never seen New York look like this. I've never seen the changes that I've witnessed uh, in these pictures. Um, bus driver. Fortunately, you guys uh, have a, uh, a good governor. And um, yeah. yesterday you were below 10 deaths. Which Yeah, it's remarkable what's happened. I just hope we can maintain it. You know, that's, that's a human nature is the greatest um, ailment with this disease. It's the greatest, uh, um, I think, um, uh, driver with this disease. And that is, is that we are all, you know, we love being together. We like to, you know, do everything together. We're social creatures. And then we become impatient. And, uh, you know, this disease doesn't, you know, care about that stuff and, it, and it's not going away. And so, you know, by dropping guard and, 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 and taking unnecessary risks, um, you know, that, this is the stuff we're seeing now and, and why it's exploding again. So, um, you know, this was a, a, a crazy image for me. Uh, when I, I drove by it, I, I, you know, I'm fascinated by Chinese culture and in particular, um, you know, really these, um, these, the, the great poster art, the propaganda art of the, of the I, I'm a real student of propaganda art. And they, they had, a, I guess it was a, a museum show and they had this illustration and I just thought with everything with, you know, you know, the Trump screaming at, you know, blaming the Chinese and all this stuff. It was just a really interesting contrast to uh, New York. I love, they, for me, uh, what I started getting into was this point counterpoint between what was physically happening in front of me and, and what the background said about it in a way. I love the kind of uh, contra contradictive narrative that goes on between sometimes posters or writing or anything like that within the city. And so a lot of times I would wait, I'd, I'd find a spot, I'd just sit there and wait in the car, wait for something to come by. Oh, you will dance again. What a great message. This was crazy. I mean, I remember this is where Dean and DeLuca was and they literally took over the entire wall and did this incredible sort of narrative, uh, you know, illustration. And just, you know, at New Yorkers, you know, they just figure it out, they always do. And so for me, it was, you know, like I, I wanted to sort of participate uh, in a way to my city, as much as I got, you know, connected to the aerials, I really felt, you know, I wanted to get inside and I wanted to see it the way I wanted to see it and get a, get a sense of really what was happening on the ground. And so these pictures are really, they really speak to that. First off, thank you all you guys for being part of this tonight. Um, it means a lot to me. My goal, you know, is I came out of my photography career and, you know, many variations um, and, you know, finally ended up where I am now at Photo PXL. It's my baby, and uh, I do this because it's a love of photography. I love sharing not only what I help uh, and create myself, but what everybody else that has that same love and passion does. And that's what this is all about, you know, allowing other people to gain more knowledge and uh, enhance their ability to see the visions that uh, are out there and, and be better photographers. And, um, you know, that's if I'm going out of this world one way or another, it, I'm happy to be going out in a way that I'm sharing everything along the way. And, um, uh, That's this what it's about, a lot man. What it's a gift, so. I got to really compliment you. You actually exhibit a, a degree of taste with your fish shirt. Yes. I thought you were going <laughs> to outdo me with your Hawaiian shirt, so I came prepared. <laughs> no, I, 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 I wanted to dial it down a little bit. Anyway, guys, thank you very much. And, thank you uh, very much, guys. It was really I a pleasure. Appreciate it. And thank you to all of the viewers. We're going to have a lot of fun with this one. And uh, we'll all be back again sometime. We're we'll pick up, Steve, with some of your uh, new work that you're going to be doing and, uh, you know, see where all that ends up. So I hope to do it. And we do want to do something with Jay and you. So it's Yeah, let's team. do that. That'd be fun. All thank right, guys. Thank you very much. I appreciate Great to see you again. Bye. Thanks again. Thanks again, guys. Great to see you. Bye now.